and welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Dr. Donald Pelto, and I have uh, Tony Gavin here with me today, and he is kind of a serial entrepreneur friend, and we're going to talk a little bit about you. Welcome from uh, across the pond. And thank you so much for having me on your show, Dr. Pelto. It's a pleasure. You're, you're, you're welcome. So, Tony, uh, tell me a little bit about who you are and, and your career history. You are a podiatrist and not in the United States, though. So you're, you're in, are you in England there or we're in Scotland? Yes, I'm in um, sunny Manchester in, in England, um, not too far where, from where I was born in, in Liverpool. Um, so, yeah, my, my career has been, um, it's been interesting, to say the least. Um, so I, my first kind of job proper job was as a prison officer um which was a whole world apart from this some uh, 20 something years ago I uh -huh. forget how long ago um, and I, I did that for a number of years and I was really fortunate in the, uh, the role I had there um, I was really engaged with delivering programs for helping young offenders develop their thinking skills problem solving strategies stopping their impulsive behaviors and um, and I was really fortunate the amount of training I got, which really started me to look at how people think and put obstacles in their own way for progression um, and people's decision-making processes. So that was the start of my career. Um, interestingly, at the same time, I was, uh, you wouldn't think it's a look at me these days, but I was uh, a, a bit of a dancer and I, was, I became involved in organizing large international dance events which was, was particularly successful, um, but it aged me pretty fast. And I realized that at the point of my mid twenties that I'm gonna have to find something I can kind of um, grab onto as a foundation of a profession. Um, so it was only then that I discovered podiatry. I didn't even know what podiatry was until I was looking through a university prospectus and I was looking at dentistry, physiotherapy, and I discovered podiatry. And it, it grabbed my interest because it was quite clear to me then that it was a relatively small niche career, um, but it's the ability to have a portfolio career that really did grab my interest. The fact that you could be involved in education, um, the fact that you could run your own business, and there's so many different branches you could go down, and you could go down different branches simultaneously, and that's really what attracted me to the world of podiatry. So I've had my own practice in Manchester for 13 years now, a multidisciplinary practice. We have podiatrists, physiotherapists, sports therapists. Um, it's a particularly successful practice and I'm, I'm very proud of it. And then some five years ago, we set up another organization um, to help private practitioners. It's called Osgo and it supports the practitioner through a whole host of things. We have this, um, this three words we use, save, grow, and comply. Save, we try and save practitioners money, obviously, through our group buying power, but we try and save them time by having bespoke solutions for the private practitioner so that it's a, a service or a product that fits the world of podiatry perfectly. Yeah. We help them grow, both personally and also grow their business as well through education, business education, and solutions for marketing, and we help them comply. So we have a whole host of um, templates and resources on the website, which mean that they can be compliant with government legislation or minimum standards of practice. So everything from reception and induction programs to health and safety, um, risk assessments, templates, all specifically done for a podiatrist. Mm. Uh, we've got thousands of members now. It's been massively successful. We have an annual conference and a really vibrant community of podiatrists who are really growing their practice through it. So it's, it's, it's been a, a fabulous, fabulous thing to be involved with. Wow. Very, very interesting. And so you were in private practice and you decided to open up this, uh, this OSCO. Tell me a little bit about the, what's the name come from? What, uh, OSCO. OSCO. So it comes from, our aim was to take the growing pains out of private practice. And you may get the clue already now, growing pains. It comes from Osgood Schlatters, um, which as you all know yourself is growing pains, quite obviously in, in teenagers a lot of the time. So it's an abbreviation of that OSGO. And also it was one of the very few four letter URLs left 
Um, so we could have osgo.co.uk. And it's pretty hard to spell it wrong unless you try and stick a Z in there. But you call that a Z, don't you? We do, yeah. I, I, we have um, we have Osco here. Uh, it's like a, a pharmacy, Jewel Osco, which is a... a oh, okay. Tool. But I, 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 I was curious about that. that. That makes total sense to take the growing things. And so how has been the journey, you, in terms of your time, do you split it 50-50 between your practice in, in Osco? Or is most of your time spent on that on that endeavor? So that's a good question. How do I split my time? I have another business as well, which is product distribution business um, that we have um, over here. So my time really is spent on where the greatest value can be delivered at that time. The practice is is pretty autonomous, so it can run without me for very long periods of time, which was. A mantra I had in the very early days of setting up the practice is I wanted a business, not a job. And that was the mantra I set out, which means that it became fully systemized so that whenever I input something to it, it's in terms of directing where it goes rather than actually having to do within it. So it doesn't take huge amounts of my time on a regular basis. But when I make the decision I want to do something with the practice, I can spend um, perhaps 100% of my available time for a couple of weeks in, in implementing that. Osgo is still very hungry for my time because it's a relatively young business and it's, um, it's a much bigger business with, um, with quite different needs than what the, the clinic has. Um, and it's also going through rapid development and, and also it's going through a period of increasing its, its employment. We've taken on a couple of people very regularly. And as you'll know, new people suck lots of time from you as they should um, because they're the biggest investment you make in any business. So I spend most of my time working with our employees and kind of coaching them through their own personal development so they can grow as individuals, which then compounds into the business. So to answer your question in a, in a more succinct way, it's very much on a needs basis whilst making sure I keep a real firm vision on where I want these businesses to go. So I'm fortunate that my working week can look very different and always does look very different from one week to another. Mm -hmm. But it's always trying to fully understand where's my maximum value at this point in time of, of what I can be delivering for either of these businesses. But with that undertone that they can all run without me for extended periods of time. Yeah. Now, now, these insights, are these things that you've developed through personal development and reading? Did you have a coach? Do you, do you get coached? How, how, how did you come up with these, these kind of forward-thinking ideas that aren't very common for podiatrists or anyone? So I've never had a formal coaching relationship. I've been very fortunate that I've had a few great mentors over the years and, and still do. Um, I do spend quite a lot of time studying um, how people run their businesses, people who I think they're doing something really good here. And I try and learn as much as possible about how they do it and what they do. I also try and spend quite a lot of time as well trying to understand why businesses don't work because I think there's an equal amount to be learned from watching businesses that are having problems and difficulties and trying to understand what's, what's the driving force behind making that happen because no one sets out for a business to fail. Mm -hmm. Everyone believes in their business, loves their business, and, and believes they give the best service. But there's always a reason underneath why things aren't going in the direction they want. So quite often watching and studying from the outside, you can, you can glean a lot of information. Um, the kind of personal development is something which it's like jumping in the deep end. There's this element of you learn to swim pretty fast. Um, so for me, I've gone through a lot of changes just through going through the actual process, but being quite rigorous with an approach that I reflect upon my performance as much as possible and try and take the lesson and try not to repeat any of the mistakes um, without taking away any of the confidence that allows you to make the mistakes. Um, and one of the greatest things I ever read was uh, a long time ago in a book from Richard Branson and his underlying philosophy is just to protect the downside so that you can go and take the risk. And I think that's been something I've always done is, well, let's look at the worst case scenario. And as long as I don't lose all my lives in this game and can't carry on playing, 
we can make some pretty big risks and try stuff and be quite open and accept the results and share the results. And if stuff doesn't work, let the world know what you tried, why you tried, why it failed, but make sure that you have some more lives left to carry on. And then you can reduce risk for a very good time if that's what's needed. Wow, that, that's great. Um, in, in terms of, uh, you've asked me a question here, we, we wrote it down about your nickname. Uh, does that nickname have to do anything with what you're doing now, this nickname that you told me about? I, I, think, it, I think it does. So um, when I was a prison officer, I was um, 21 years old. I was, um, it's, it's quite cruel what they used to do to you in the prison service in that, those days. I worked in Liverpool jail, which was uh, an old Victorian jail. And it had some pretty bad people in there. And I was a 21 year old who'd lived quite a sheltered existence. And they, you have a brand new uniform, which is almost neon white. And you stick out like a sore thumb that you're brand new, barely shaving. And as a new entry prison officer, they put you on what they call the fives, which is the old Victorian jails, it's the fifth floor. Um, and in those days, they used to put the most difficult prisoners at the top and the nicest prisoners on the bottom and everything in between. And of course they don't manage prisons like that anymore, but they did then. And as a new entry prison officer, it was almost a rite of passage is that your first shift, they stick you up on the fives, up on the top. And I was terrified and I was walking around the landing all day. And that's basically your brief is to just walk around the landing all day as you're getting a feel for the place. And I was just talking to myself all, all day and basically just get home alive was the only thing because I've never been in an environment like this in my life. It was, it was terrifying. And you have this degree of authority instilled in you as well. And I was walking around the landing all day long and the other prison officers were calling me scale electric. Uh, do you have scale electric over in the States? What is it? The car on the track where you squeeze the button and the cars go racing around. Oh yeah, the, 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 yeah, the game. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they were calling me. That's, that was my name was scale electric. And, um, I didn't dare ask for a while why they were calling me that at the end of the day, I, I asked them why. And they said, cause you've not let go of the handrail for a single moment all day. And, and, and I think the the lesson from that is, and what I it still stays with me now is everybody. And we were speaking earlier before we started recording, people look for certainty. And in that environment, the only certainty I had was that handrail was not moving and I clung to it for the majority of that shift. Mm. And I think that's something that I keep in mind whenever we're developing stuff with OSCO for our members or stuff with the clinic is people are looking for certainty in a world where certainty does not exist. Mm -hmm. The more certainty we can create by being extremely predictable in everything that we do, and being as transparent in things that we can do, the greater chance we have of being able to effectively serve people is through mm. creating certainty out of uncertainty. Um, and I think my first lesson of it started there in, in the jail. That's great. That's great. Um, now, what, what do you see? Now, this pandemic is going to pass by us. And if we were three years from now, and you're going to look back, what are the things that you're excited about? What do you think is going to be next? Uh, both within your business and even in society that kind of makes you exciting for the future? Yeah, I think there's a number of things. I think people will lean in much more towards technology to be able to develop more solutions remotely. I think that's an obvious thing that is going to happen. I don't believe the majority will go to telehealth, but I think those people who have particular skills um, will be able to expand the geographical scope of practice. And I think we'll be leaning much more into that. I think we'll have much more interprofessional collaboration as well through using this technology because we've been, we've been forced into it for a, for a period of time. I think we're going to become much more flexible for, with how we deliver our care, how we project our message to the general public. And I think our business structures are most likely going to change as well because we need to be much more, certainly in the UK, we need to be much more robust in our infrastructure of how our businesses are set up. And we need to be able to collaborate much more and understand what's common between us. We need to pool more resources where possible between businesses 
so that we can leverage that strength in unity together. And I think we're going to see much more of that through technological solutions, through administration solutions. I think that's going to become a much bigger thing because the idea that the solo practice can be everything to everyone, I think it's going to be at such a disadvantage in the future if it stays in that space that when problems like this come, it's going to be much more difficult for them to survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that this whole integration is going to be very, very, very important. Um, and where do you feel like your biggest strengths are going forward in terms of where, where do you think you can offer the most value? You started talking about providing value to people. Where do you see the future value that you can provide for those that, that are in OSCO, those, you know, those that are around you? I think giving people the resilience, I think giving them some of the obvious solutions which can help them be resilient, but also in being able to have a look at the mindset. And I think through creating a culture of embracing change and looking for positivity and for looking for solutions, because I think to hark back to the way that things were or how things used to be, or um, almost grieving changes that happen, it has a place, but it doesn't serve any purpose for the future. And I think if the mindset is always one of, how do we improve? How do we get better? How do we develop something new? And remove some of that risk of failure and also an understanding that certainty doesn't exist except for what you can create for small periods of time. I, I think really addressing people's mindsets is probably the biggest thing that that I'm able to offer, um, whether that's from an individual patient or whether it's dealing with members of OSGO who are growing their practice and business, it's very much having a look at what's in your control, what can you do, what improvements can we make? Um, and that's the same story, whether it's an athlete who has an injury and can't do what they used to do and is, is grieving through that process of their, their career or their life being impacted to such a degree, it's switching the focus on where are we now and how can we make things better for a period of time? And it's the same if it's an injury. It's the same if it's a business that's in trouble. It's the exact same thing. It is all about the approach and the mindset to it. Yeah. So if people are interested in learning more about OSCO, uh, what's the website? Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of websites. If I, if I may say, that would be really good. So um, osco.co.uk is the main website. And we also have a great online portal, which has a whole host of courses, business skills, clinical skills, and essential updates. And that's osgolearning.co.uk. And a load of the courses on there are absolutely free. So yeah, it'd be great if people that's would great. go visit that. Uh, and, and Tony, as we finish up, I know a lot of the young doctors are going to be watching this young podiatrist, maybe from the States or from the UK. Um, in, in terms of those that are just kind of starting out, it seems like there's a lot of overwhelm of information. You can do podcasts, you can do courses, you can do this, you can do that. For, for a young person starting out, what, what are the tips you have to kind of funnel down what you're going to focus on in terms of you can't learn everything? No, no, you can't learn everything. And I think you're right. We've got such an overload of media, haven't we, at, at the moment? I think personally, my strategy is I will find something I like, either a, a person who's speaking or a type of media, and I will over consume for a period of time but keep an awareness that, okay, at the moment, this is my thing I'm interested in. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to hold true forever. Mm -hmm. But whenever you do it, make sure you go and seek out the opposite. Just like with mentors and coaches, find someone who's really successful to watch and study, then find someone who's not so successful. And when you're being exposed to new ideas, whether it's clinical or with business, go and look for the other side. Go and look for the person who argues listen to both sides and take some time to absorb that. So what I would say is find what interests you, first of all, then just go and seek out the opposite. And you have a whole career ahead of you where your mind will change a million times. And, and that's exactly as it should be. Great. Well, thank you so much, Tony. This is uh, Tony uh, Gavin from OSCO. Thank you so much for your time, Tony. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Hey guys, thank you for watching Healthy Living. You're going to find a few links here I'd like you to click. One is to subscribe to this channel on YouTube. Uh, also, you can learn more. There are some videos here you can see.